so I want to talk about uh, Kotlin, Kotlin uh, as, a, as a language, and uh, we'll talk about a, more of a focus of for a Java programmer, but I want to just step back a little bit and talk about a little broadly before we do that. So, so what, is, uh, what is Kotlin? Kotlin is a statically typed language. Uh, so what that means is the compiler is going to verify the type sanity for us. Uh, we're used to static typing in languages like Java, uh, but Java itself is evolving quite a bit. But when it comes to static typing, I often look for languages like Haskell, which have a much greater support for static typing than languages like Java do. And then Kotlin can perform some really nice type verification uh, in that regard. Uh, Scotland compiles down to multiple different, different platforms. Uh, I'm just listing a few here, but Kotlin compiles down to Java bytecode. But Kotlin also can compile down to Android environment. It, excuse me, it can compile down to JavaScript. You can compile a Kotlin to a native. You can compile Kotlin to WebAssembly. So in that regard, Kotlin is probably one of the few languages that is truly a multi-platform language. So what that means is you can write Kotlin, but you can get multiple different uh, implementations of it uh, if, you, if you want to and get that kind of diversity. Uh, one of the really things that uh, keeps uh, people's attention is, or catches people's attention is, uh, Kotlin is extremely fluent. Uh, Kotlin is elegant, and, and when you look at Kotlin code, Kotlin code is very uh, uh, fluent and elegant in terms of how you write it, how you read it. Uh, it just feels right when you are writing the code. Uh, it becomes much more less verbose and more concise. Uh, and it brings a wonderful feature of several other languages. This is one of the things that uh, intrigued me personally is, uh, like I mentioned earlier, I program in about 15 different languages, so when I started looking at Kotlin, it was like a journey through, oh, I've seen this in C-sharp, I've seen this in Ruby, I've seen this in Python, I've seen this in Haskell, I've seen this in Erlang. And, and so it was kind of like, uh, you know, meeting old relatives in a way, right? You, you're, it's like, oh, I've seen this one before. And you can see that uh, taking a different shape in Kotlin. And, and, and that's really what Kotlin really did is Kotlin uh, designers learned a lot from a lot of different languages. Uh, in a way, I would argue, uh, people aspire to be polyglot, pro polyglot programmers. Uh, I would say Kotlin is a polyglot language in itself because it's one language that really got inspired by a lot of different languages. Um, so Kotlin, uh, how do you really use Kotlin? There are a couple of different ways for us to be able to do this. Let's take a couple of different examples and play with it. Uh, let's go ahead and write a function. Well, you write a function using the word fun because Kotlin wants you to think of having fun every time you write a function. And then I'm gonna say main over here. And within here, all I'm gonna do is print hello. That's all I'm gonna do. So this is just a main function. I've created that within this file. And, and what is this uh, file? I'm going to uh, call this file actually as uh, kt, so I'll call this as kt for a minute. So, so what does this uh, file kt contain? It contains the code we just wrote. So the extension for Kotlin is the uh, extension kt, and that's what we have here is the little Kotlin code. What I can do here is I can say Kotlin uh, 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 jvm, so Kotlin uh, jvm, is uh, just a flavor of Kotlin that is going to uh, be implementing into the JVM. I'm using Kotlin 1.3 here, but you can do Kotlin C-JVM or JS if you want JavaScript and so on. So in this case, I have a Kotlin JVM. Uh, Sample.kt is the one that I'm compiling. And what this does is, as you would expect, it, it creates a file for you and, and the file that it creates over here, uh, it is called samplekt.class. Because I did not write a class, Kotlin decided to name this file as samplekt. Now you can run this as Java if you want to really run this as Java, uh, or I can simply run this as Kotlin, and then I'm going to specify the Kotlin uh, samplekt and run it. As you can see, it ran and said hello. So I'm executing the code right there. But of course, in this case, I'm running this as a compiled code, or I can run it as Java minus class path and, and provide the class path for Java like we traditionally do, and you can run the code as well that way. 
well, that's definitely exciting. I'm going to get rid of the dot class file. And, and while you can run this and compile it and run it, uh, I'm a big fan of quickly getting something prototype and running and working. For production code, I would write classes, but if I'm really prototyping and playing with it, I'm a big fan of writing things that are scripts. So notice here, I'm going to change it to KTS, where KTS is the extension for Kotlin script. So now that I named it as KTS, if I get the KTS file, notice that in this case, I don't even have to write that much. I'm going to simply write the print hello. That's all I'm going to place right in here. So I just drop some code here into the KTS file. And now I come here and say Kotlin uh, JVM, but I'm going to use a script option and provide the KTS over here. So I'm running this as a script. So I'm not doing an explicit compilation at this point. So if I ask for the .class file, it doesn't exist as you can see, but I'm using a script option to run it. So this is a nice way to get Kotlin you know, uh, running, run it as a script and it'll compile it behind the scenes and run the code for you. So that's an example of a Kotlin script. You can run that as a script as you can see, but you can also run it as a REPL as well. And, and that's one of the things I like doing a lot is just bring up a REPL and play with it. So Kotlin, uh, Kotlin uh, CJVM, notice, I'm running this without a file name, without a dash script, and when you run it this way, it runs in the mode of a, of a repo. And, and so within here, I can type some code and see what the response is. So I said two plus three is five, for example. I can also say print line uh, high, for example, and you can pretty much play with this right here. So this is a nice tool for experimenting. Write a little code, play with it, uh, and then, of course, you can you know copy and paste that code and move forward. So that can be a very nice way to play with a little code. Now let's talk about the language features itself. I want to go ahead and write a little piece of code right here. So I'm going to say hello, and I'm going to go ahead and run this code right away uh, to see the result of hello. But did you notice I did not use a semicolon? Well, semicolon is optional. You don't have to put a semicolon, but if you really want to, you could put a semicolon, but you don't have to put a semicolon. Now, this is one thing you should really get used to when it's programming in Kotlin, especially if you're coming from Java, is our little pinky has taken years of abuse. And, and there's a reason why the pinky is smaller than the other fingers, right? Because it's emotionally deprived over the years. While these other fingers do useful things, this is keep eating pinky. And, and so moving forward into Kotlin, you can give some relief to your pinky. You don't have to type the semicolon. Uh, you know, also when you go back to program in Java, that becomes a bit of a problem. Because the other day I was coding in Java and the compiler was telling me, you are missing a semicolon. And I was arguing with the compiler, I'm not missing it, you see. So the point really is that you don't have to miss semicolons, you can just throw it away. That becomes really nice. Kotlin also gives you really nice warnings, much more than you would expect from languages like Java. So for example, let's say you have a, a list of values, let's say uh, numbers, let's say, and I'm gonna say is equal to list of one, two, and three. What I wanna do here is to print out numbers.reduce and, and in the reduce method, I'm gonna take a value element and a total, let's say total comma element, and I'm going to return, let's say in this case, a total plus element. So a, a very simple example as you can see in here, and I'm going to simply return a, a total of those values. Of course, I could have written it as a sum, but just to illustrate the point right here, I'm gonna write code like this. So when I run this code this time though, you will notice that it's going to produce the value uh, based on the content of what we are uh, writing here, which is gonna be the call to this particular function. Not sure what the error there is, but let's go a little forward. Let's take the element and double it for a second. So I'm gonna take this element given to us, whatever the element is, and I'm gonna say element times, uh, let's say two for a minute. So all I'm doing is doubling the values given to me, that's all I'm interested in doing, nothing really uh, exciting. Well, given this example though, if you were to uh, produce uh, output like this, but what if you really don't care about the value given, and what if you were to return, let's say, just a, a two times two for each of the values? Well, clearly it'll be four for each of the values, so you can see four, four, four on the top, 
But if you notice, there's a warning. The warning is the parameter E is never used. So the compiler is trying to kind of give you a little warning to say, hey, did you really forget to use that? Is there a bug? Is there an error? Or you can tell the compiler, no, I really did not forget it. I was intentional in not using it. So how do you say that? Well, I found out there's a very special symbol now in a lot of different languages, and that is called underscore. What is underscore? Underscore is the international symbol for I don't care. So essentially by putting an underscore you're saying I just don't care and as a result you can see that Kotlin doesn't give you a warning right now because it's a symbol for I don't care. You can simply ignore that. So that's an example of warnings that you get really nicely. But what is also exciting about Kotlin is Kotlin is a language that gives you a, a really good amount of type inference. It doesn't go overboard with it though. So let's take a look at an example of this. So I want to create a variable, let's call it as greet, but I want to say it's a string and I'm going to set it to a hello. And then I want to go ahead and print out the value of greet right there. Notice the difference between Kotlin and Java here. Your variable name goes first, a colon, and then the type of the variable after that. The reason for this is Kotlin emphasizes that the name of the variable is more important than the type itself. So the type is something you can leave out if you don't want to specify it. Now real quick, obviously here, if I said greet is equal to one, notice that it tells me I cannot modify the value once I assign to it because val is immutable. However, if I were to set this to high, notice that I get actually uh, an error, well in this case it's telling me I cannot reassign the value a uh, high obviously, but what if this was a bar if you will, now in this case you can see it's complaining that this is a string, well if I uh, change it to a 1, what's going to happen? Well if I change it to a 1, sorry let me try this again, if I change it to a 1, what does the error say? The error is saying I cannot reassign a val, but notice the second error, it says you cannot set an integer uh, to a string. So clearly it knows what the type of greet is, it's a string. However, you don't have to go that far, you can use type inference. So if I don't say that greet is a string, it already knows that greet is a string. How does it know it? Because you're assigning the string to it, so that's pretty darn obvious. So when I run this code, you can see that it's a value hello, but if I were to try to set the value of one, notice the error is again, uh, in the bottom it says I cannot set an integer to a string because the type is inferred as a string. So in this case of course it knows the type, you don't have to say the type every single time, that is essentially type inference. You are able to use type inference for local variables, you can use type inference for fields, but you cannot use type inference for method parameters. Uh, some languages will try to infer the type of method parameters, Kotlin doesn't go that far, I'm thankful for that because uh, it can be really hard to understand the code if you don't put the type in the parameters of the functions, so Kotlin requires you to do that. Uh, what about the return type? Well, we'll talk about that in just a minute. Kotlin does have a variation. It has a val, as we saw earlier. So val, for example, max equal to 100, and I'm going to go ahead and print the max right here, and, and the max is going to be a value of 100, as you would expect here, and you can see the value of 100 being printed right there. But because we defined as a max, I am not allowed to modify the value of max. So if I run the code, I get an error saying val cannot be reassigned. But if I really, really wanted to, you can create immutability as well. So here I called it as a bar instead of a val. So now you can see that I'm able to modify the val. So what is bar? A bar in Kotlin is called the keyword of shame. So if you use it, you have to look down, cannot make eye contact with your colleagues, and they find out you used a bar in the code, didn't you? And then you can go back and refactor it. Well, it's easy to search for where you're using bar, and you can refactor your code as well. So that's basically for mutability. Try to avoid it as much as you can. Now, you also have a nice uh, literal uh, template. So if you want to, for example, say val name is equal to, let's go ahead and say Joe, you can print out something like hello and then plus name. And we all have done this in the past and it is so boring. Well, thankfully you don't have to do it this way. 
what you can do is you can put a dollar sign and you can simply put the name as a variable and you can write code like this so you can see hello Joe being printed right there. So this becomes a nice way to put an expression in place. So hello dollar name simply is expanding to hello Joe. Similarly, if you really want to provide a, a expression, you can do that as well. So for example, I can say two uppercase right here. And as a result, you can see it says hello, but with Joe in uppercase. So you can write an expression also with the curly braces. So that becomes a nice little uh, string literal for you to write as well. So that becomes a nice way to uh, expand uh, uh, strings with expressions. You can also write a multi-line string. And multi-line strings can be expanded very nicely. So you can write multiple lines of text and you can have uh, expressions in it. You can expand it. But if you want to indent them, you can indent them. For that, you can use a trim margin to remove the margin. You can do that pretty nicely also. Well, one thing I want to quickly mention here is that expressions over statements. Uh, one of the things that I begin to appreciate more and more languages is that languages that provide expressions and expressions, of course, one of the nice things about expressions is expressions don't cause immutable, immutability. So expressions can compute and return a value back to you rather than causing mutation or side effects. Well, languages like Java predominantly supported, uh, you know, statements like for statement and if statement. Now, why should languages have statements when they can have expressions? So a lot of these things can become expressions in languages, and that saves quite a bit of effort. So for example, let's say I have um, a function called can vote, and this takes an age as a value, let's say. Now, in this case, I want to uh, say whether a person can vote or not. So what do you typically do in a language like Java? So I could do something like this, right? I can I can go ahead and print out. I can say uh, can vote, and I can pass a age, let's say 12. I can also print and say can vote and pass, let's say, uh, an age of 20. Now, if I were to call this particular function, I want to return a string. So in this case, I'm going to say a string, and and I'm going to return whether they can vote or not. Well, we could do something like this, right? So I can say uh, vote is equal to uh, please vote and then I can say if age is less than 18 I could say uh, vote is equal to you know I could say go home kid right so don't uh, bother voting and then I could also say return and I could also say in this case let's remove the please from here and I could say uh, please and then of course I could put a dollar vote and, and depending on the age of the kid, I could return a value back to that. So in this case, please go home kid and please vote. So you can try writing like this. But as you can see, the code is pretty verbose, but this is very natural in language like Java because if is a statement in Java. You cannot assign the result of an if to a variable in Java because it's not an expression. But the question is, why can't we really use expressions? So I could take this as a val, if you will, and I could say vote is equal to, and I could ask the question, so if age uh, is equal to, is less than 18, then I could simply say go home kid, and else if the person is not uh, you know, less than uh, 18, I could simply say vote over here and return that part of the code. So you can see how we could start writing expressions and if is an expression rather than being a statement. So you can take the result of an if and you can assign it. So a lot of things in Kotlin are expressions and as a result you can do uh, composability much more easily as well and you can take the result. It doesn't cost mutation for you. That's one big benefit for us to uh, use in this particular case. Now, talking about functions, let's talk about how to write functions. Well, functions are written using the fun keyword. The return type of a function is inferred. Excuse me, if the function is a function is a single uh, expression. So in other words, if the function is very small, you don't have to specify the type of the function. Of course, if your function is a little bit bigger, you are going to put a, a, a curly braces, your block body, then you want to really tell what the return type of the function is. You can also write void functions as well, and the return type is considered to be unit in those cases. Let's take a look at a function here. So I can say fun, and let's say in this case, can vote, and it takes a age as a reference, a parameter here. But notice, 
I don't have to say what the return type is. I can simply say if age is less than 18, I can simply say go home kid and then else I can return vote and if you notice over here, I can print can vote and put a 12 in there and you can see the result of that is go home kid but if I put a 21 instead of a 12, you can see that it says vote so you can pretty much write a function where the return type is inferred for you and if the function is small, you can use type inference. If the function is not small, if you're going to provide a block body, then you cannot really use type inference. You have to say what the type is, otherwise it's going to assume it's a void function, so be a little careful about it. You can also provide default arguments to functions as well. So default arguments can be a really powerful way to extend an existing code. So if you have a Greek function, let's say I have a name, and I'm going to take a string as an argument, and within this function, I'm going to print out hello, and then I'm going to print a name after that. So if I call greet, and I'm going to say uh, Jane over here, you can see that this code is going to print out, you know, hello Jane. But what if you want to really customize the message you want to print, not hello all the time? Well, the nice thing about this is you can go back to this code and say comma message. And you can say that this message is a string, but you can then specify over here a high, if you will. So if you pass a value, it'll take the value. If you don't pass a value, it will substitute it with the value that is the default value. So when I run the code this time, you can see that it actually says, hi, Jane. But on the other hand, if I were to say Jerry over here, and I'm going to say uh, howdy, it takes the word howdy instead and passes that down. So as a result, you can see the value is actually howdy, Jane, rather than being a uh, high. So that's an example of using a default parameter to functions. Now, not only can you do this, when you're using default parameters, you can also benefit from one other thing. For example, if you go back to this code right here, you can take the name, notice the name is the first argument, and you can take the name and you can actually specify name.length over here, if you will. So as a result, you can see here, you can, when you run the code, it says howdy, Jerry, because you gave the value howdy, but if you don't pass the howdy, this is a very geeky way of saying high five to Jerry, you can do that as well. So one parameter can use other parameters to its left as well when you're using a default argument. So it's not a default parameter value, it's a default parameter expression. That's what you're actually specifying in here is really an expression you are providing to it, and that's pretty powerful. Similarly, you can use named arguments as well. Named arguments are pretty darn powerful because you don't, if you have multiple parameters of the same type, sometimes it can be confusing. I'm sure you have seen your share of functions where you call a function and you see 7, 9, 22. And you're like, what does 7 mean? What do 9 mean? What do 22 mean? It's not very clear. You have to know the order in which the parameters are being passed in. Well, the nice thing about this is you can specify name is equal to and you can say comma message is equal to a uh, hello. You can give named arguments as well. But the nice thing about named arguments is you can specify a named argument in any sequence you want to. So you can specify a named argument message followed by the argument name. You can do it this way also. So this gives you a better readability of the code because when you look at the method, it's pretty clear what the type of the arguments are and that can be uh, very uh, easy to you know, self-document the code, becomes more expressive as well. You can mix those definitely along with, if you will, uh, arguments that are named and positional as well. So you can say, uh, you know, a, a Jane, comma, message equals to, and you can specify that too if you really wanted to. So you can put positional and the named after that also. You can also use variable number of arguments to the code. So you can use var args and you can use a spread operator to spread them. So that can become a lot easier to convey a certain intent in terms of passing arguments. So for example, var arg, well, let's go ahead and say I have a names which is gonna be a string. And what do I wanna do here? I'm gonna go ahead and print the names given to me right here. So I'm gonna call a greet. Let's go ahead and say Jack, comma Jill 
are the two values that I'm interested in passing to this particular function. So in this case, let's go ahead and say these are the names. I'm going to print out what the values are in this names. So names dot, let's go ahead and say uh, for, let's say in this case, uh, a name uh, of names, and I want to just print out the name given to me. So we'll just say name. So you can receive the names as a collection, and you can uh, work with that collection as well, very easily to print the values, if you will. So you can see Jack and Jill being printed right there in terms of the values Jack and Jill. So this is a variable number of arguments. Now what is uh, nice about this is you can take uh, any number of arguments, 0, 1, 2 or more depending on what your situation is. So this is very much like what we did in Java. But on the other hand, what if you already had a collection of values on your hand and you want to take this collection of values and you want to pass to the uh, object? Well. You won't be able to pass an array over to the discrete values because the type checking says I'm expecting discrete variables, uh, discrete parameters or arguments. You cannot pass an array to me. This is where you can deal with uh, things that are a little different. So for example, if I say numbers, and I'm going to say bar arg for the numbers, and this is going to be integer values. And in this case, we'll simply go ahead and print out the numbers for a minute. So if I were to, actually, here's an idea. Let's go ahead and return from here. Uh, max, uh, well, numbers.max, a little cheating of this value here. So we'll go ahead and say equal to and return just that value. So this max, what is this going to do? I could try to call max over here with a two and a three and a, uh, let's say a, a five and a three. Well, this is going to return to us the maximum value from the collection of values uh, given to this function. Uh, nothing returned, of course, I uh, need to return the value. So let's go ahead and uh, run that code. So that's going to return the value five, as you can see. Well, that works. But what if I were to create something a little different? What if I were to create, let's say, val values equal to uh, int array of, let's say, three, seven, and two, and four, so that's my int array that I created, but I want to pass this int array uh, to this particular function. What do I do for passing this integer array? So, um, well, actually, if I want to do something like that, you would have to pass this as an array, but this won't really like it because it's an array, but a discrete values are expected. This is where you can use a spread operator basically a start to say explore this for me and spread send that that as a exported data so you can pass a exported data array as well and that is something you can do pretty nicely well so far so good but one of the things that a language does is it to make your life really easy well this is one of the things that really made me happy when it comes to kotlin is kotlin does not want to treat you as a child kotlin treats you as an adult kotlin doesn't, doesn't tell you you will write code this way. Kotlin says, whatever way you want to write code, write it. But I'm going to make it the journey easier for you in that way of writing. So what if you're saying, I want to write code in the imperative style. I want to write code using the for loops. Uh, Kotlin won't tell you how shame on you, you shouldn't write it. Instead, Kotlin says, well, okay, you want to write using a for loop. Let me remove some of the noise for you. You don't have to say i equal to zero, i equal to i plus one. You don't have to go through that noise. Let's make life really easy. So this is where a beautiful, nice for loop comes in. So let's take a look at some examples here. So I want to say far over here, and, and this particular far is going to go through the range of values, let's say one to 10. So I can say far some value x in one to 10, and what I can do here is simply print out the value of x. So an element can be, you can loop through it, and you can see that it starts with the value 1, increments at one value at a time, but notice the value 10 is included as well. Now, some of you may have realized uh, that this syntax is very similar to what you use in Ruby. So in Ruby, you have a range, and similarly, you have a range here as well. So that's a nice little concise syntax to get a range of values. So if I were to go through one through five right here, the output includes the value one, but excuse me, it also includes the value five as you can see here. So given this, of course, what if I don't want the value five? You can then say until, 
and you can write the code like this. Now, notice how it said one, two, and not including the five. Now, looking at this code, you may wonder, hmm, that's kind of interesting fluent syntax, but here's the beautiful thing about Kotlin. These things are not just part of the language where you can only do it within the language. These are part of the syntax you could do for your own code. So this could be one of your objects. This could be another of your own objects. And this could be your method. And you can write code like this also. And the reason why this works is that until is actually a method on the object one, which takes a parameter of five. So you're like, gosh, can I write code like this? And it turns out when you run the code, that works as well. But I challenge you not to write code like this. Because if you write code like this, you'll be alone sitting and eating lunch. Nobody else wants to dine with you after that. After all, you're writing very verbose code, isn't it? So as absolutely, you can write the code with a space right there, as you can see. And you can see that the code is a lot more easier to write right there, uh, easy to read rather. So that becomes more fluent. Now you may wonder, how is it that I can just leave out the parentheses? We'll talk about this later on. That comes from what's called an infix notation that's built into a uh, Kotlin. So this gives you an idea about how to write a for loop. You can skip a value absolutely if you want to. Similarly, you can also step the values. So for example, you can say a 10, step two, if you will. So notice in this case, you are able to say one, three, five, seven, nine, and it's stepping through the values. That becomes very fluent, as you can see, in terms of how you're writing the code. So that becomes really nice way to express it. Similarly, you can use a down to rather than uh, going up the uh, steps. So you can say uh, for int i, uh, 10 uh, down to one, let's say, and in this case, you're starting the iteration at 10, but you're counting all the way down. So that becomes very fluent way to write it. So you don't have to be messing with I minus minus and all that thing. But also one other thing to consider in here. While you're looking at this, you know, curious, you're saying, oh, this is interesting. What is X after all? Or when you write code like this, where you say for name in, and I'm gonna say list of, let's say Tom comma Jerry. And in this case, of course, I wanna just go ahead and print out, if you will, uh, the, the name itself. So when you look at this code, earlier, if you remember, we saw val and var. So the obvious question is, hey, what about val, what about var? Maybe I should put val over here, or maybe I should put var over here. Well, Kotlin made a decision for this one for you already. So it, in other words, let's think about this. Does it make sense to really change the value of name right here? Yeah, the answer is no. There is zero opportunity where this actually makes sense. So the language makes a decision for you. So notice val cannot be reassigned. So as a result, Kotlin already made this a val you never have to make the decision in that case. Similarly, in this case, <clears throat> if I say x equal to zero, you can see that you get an error because obviously it makes no sense to reassign it. So you cannot put val, you cannot put bar. It is absolutely a val automatically because the code is a lot safer when we do that. Similarly, you can uh, you know, step over the values as you go down to as well. Well, you can also iterate over a list of values. You saw that a minute ago. So for example, if I were to write uh, uh, names is equal to list of, and I'm gonna say Tom, let's say, comma, Jerry. And in this case, I wanna say for name uh, in names, and I'm going to simply print out the name given to me. Well, you can see that's very easy to print the name Tom and Jerry, but, one of the nice things about the older syntax that we use in Java is you get the index value as well. So if you want to access the index and the element, that was really easy function. Okay, so far so good. Well, if the person name is equal to Robert, I'm gonna return, in this case, Bob, right? So that's a very well-known well, well -known, um, return, uh, nickname, so I'm gonna return it. Okay, that's great so far. Excuse me, so if I were to run this, and I call nickname, and I send Robert, well, I want this to be returning uh, you know, Bob, that will work. But what if it's not a name I recognize? What am I gonna do? 
So I'm going to say if it is not, return a null. So I'm going to say if the name is not what I recognize, I mean, I can go through a series of names and find a nickname. If the name doesn't exist, I'm going to return a null. Okay, so what's going to happen here? If I were to call this with a nickname and pass, let's say, Venkat over here, that code won't compile. Why not? Well, the reason the code doesn't compile is line number four has an error. Line number four says null cannot be a value of a non-null type string. So Kotlin has two different types. One is a nullable type and the other is a non-nullable type. A non-nullable type cannot have a null as a value. So unlike references in Java, a reference can refer to a valid object, but a reference can also hold a null. Not so in Kotlin. Non-nullable references cannot hold null. Only a nullable reference can hold nulls. So string is a non-nullable. You cannot assign a null to it. And the compiler rejected right here. So this makes your code a lot safer. You're not accidentally going to return a null. On the same token, if a function's return type is a non-nullable type, you will never get a null pointer exception out of it. So that makes your code a lot safer as well. Well, okay, that's great. But what if I really want to return a null? What do I really do? Well, in general, it's better to avoid it. But if you really, really, really have to, you could mark it as a nullable type. So when you mark it as a nullable type, this gives you permission to return a null. So when I run this notice, it said Bob for Robert, but it said null for Venkat. Just for the sake of record, null is not a nickname for Venkat. But the, but the point really here is that you have a nullable type and you're returning this nullable type uh, over here. Now, you can see that it allows you to pass a nullable type when the return type is nullable. Now, how do I pass this as a parameter to the function if I want to pass it as a parameter? Well, what you can do here is similarly, in this example, what if I call print, but I send a nickname, but I want to send a null. I don't have any name to send to it. Well, obviously, you cannot send null to a name because name is not a nullable type. So the code will not work on line number nine. It doesn't want you to pass a null. You can mark this as a nullable type if you really want to. In that case, you're allowed to pass a null. Now, that brings up a concern. If you're allowed to pass a null like this, let's change this a little bit for a minute. Let's step back to what we had a minute ago. So going back to this, what if I were to not return, I'll simply say no nickname, right? So in this case, if you have a nickname, you get it. If you don't have a nickname, you get no nickname. But what if I were to pass this as a nullable type, where I say you could potentially pass a null to me? Well, if I were to receive a nullable type, what's going to happen? What if I want to get the length of the name? Or what if I want to reverse the name? Hey, here's an idea. If the nickname exists, I will return the nickname. If the nickname doesn't exist, I will say name.reverse, right? So that would be a really nice way to give a nickname. So, but what's going to happen now? Well, you notice, if I don't have this one, when I run the code, it says Bob for uh, whatever the name Bob is. But what if Bob doesn't really exist? It's going to try to reverse the name and, and return for that particular name. Let's see what the error says here. So it's going to return uh, the reverse of that particular name. Unresolved reverse. Actually, it's not too happy with the reverse here. But anyway, so we can, we can do some kind of operation like that. Let's say I want to get the length of the particular person's name, and I want to just return based on the length as, as if that were the value that I want to return from this. But the point really is that I'm able to take this object and access it. But what if I go back again and make it a nullable type? Well, the problem here is if the type is nullable, am I safe to call length after all? Notice a call of the length when this is null would result in a null pointer exception. And Kotlin says, no, 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 you don't want to do that because you'll get bitten if, you, if that word happened. I'm going to safeguard you. So how does it really safeguard me? Well, the way it safeguards is, first of all, it prevents me from accessing that particular variable directly. I got to perform a null check. So here's an idea. What if I were to do the following? What if I were to go back here and say, if name is not equal to null, then return name.length. 
Otherwise, what do I return? I'm going to say return uh, will say, uh, you know, uh, in, uh, no, uh, no. So I could try something like this. So in this case, if it's Bob, it returned Robert, it's returned Bob. It's Venkat, it returned the value six. If I were to call this with, let's say, a nickname with a null, it's going to return nope because there is nothing to do with it. Hey, that's great, but this code is a little verbose. It's a little smelly. It's got to be a lot more concise than this, isn't it? Well, here's an idea. What if we go back to this code and we return, in this case, if the value exists, we can say if the name, so we could say name dot, but instead question dot length. So this gives the opportunity to say if the name exists, if it's not null, execute that particular function. If the name doesn't exist, don't execute that function, right? So you can ask it to selectively execute a function if it were there and not execute it if it, if it was not there. So this can give you an idea about checking for a value and making a decision based on the value. So in this case, if I say val length is equal to, and I can assign the value of length if it exists, and what can I do? Otherwise, I can return a nope. But what if there's a value was there? I can try to return the length of the value if it were if it were there. So this gives you a safety net when it comes to accessing the variables. And so if the value were to exist, it's going to get you the value. Let's go ahead and print out the value and see what the length says over here, just to kind of experiment and see what it says. Notice that the value exists, you got the value, which is six. And if the value doesn't exist, then the value is a null. So this gives you an idea about how you can ask for the value in a very safe way. Well, so this becomes a value or a null. But what if you really want to, once again, uh, get the value or give a substitute value if the value did not exist. This is where an operator called the Elvis operator really comes in. So the Elvis operator can substitute a value if the value doesn't exist or will execute the method and take the value if the value were there. Well, not only can you execute with these kinds of uh, uh, conciseness, you can also do the auto casting we talked about earlier. So in other words, if you're going to access a variable, it is smart enough to know based on where you are in the code, it realizes that a null check has been performed. And then if you were to access the variable directly, it'll let you go back and do that without having to really worry about performing a cast again. And that can make your life really easy. So what I showed you just now is Kotlin makes imperative style of programming really more fluent. It gives you nice pattern matching syntax. We also saw how you can actually do deal with nulls really safely as well. But what if you're a big fan of functional style of programming? If you are really interested in functional style of programming, Kotlin makes that really uh, possible and very elegant as well. So for example, let's take a look at an example of names is equal to, and let's create a list of names. List of, let's say, uh, let's say Tom uh, and Jerry, and we will create one more, we'll say Spike over here. So if I have a bunch of names right here, what I can do is I can use a functional style to perform some operations here. For instance, I could say names.filter. And given a name, I can say name.length is equal to of, of five. And I'm going to just go ahead and print the result of this. And when I run this code, you can see that the resulting collection only contains names that have value of length five. So this filter can be used nicely to extract that data. Not only can I do that, I can do a map operation from here. And in the map, I can say, given a name, return a name dot to uppercase, and I can convert the code, uh, the, the names to uppercase, and I can return it. So in this case, you can see Jerry and Spike are in uppercase as well. But Kotlin also makes your life really easy by providing conciseness also. 
If you're used to Java's method references, you know that you can use a method reference in the case of Java, so you don't have to write verbose code. You can write a much simpler code to uh, provide that as well. So in this case, I'm going to take a string, which is the uh, type of this particular object, and I can provide the string. Let me try this a little differently. So I can provide the string as a method reference to this to say, I want to execute this as a method reference, and you can see how that's working as well. So you can use a lambda where it makes sense, but you can also use a method reference where it makes sense. You can also use a function reference also, not just a method reference. This is something you don't have access to in, in Java, isn't it? But if all I have is a function, I can use that function too. Let's take a look at an example. Suppose I were to write a function here called uh, to upper, and what does the to upper do? This is a function that takes a name as a string, and it's going to return name dot to uppercase. And, and so take a look at the to upper function. How would I use that here? Well, I could have done something like name arrow uh, to upper and pass the name to it like this. So that syntax is using a lambda, but what if I really want to use that function, don't want to put too much effort into it? Well, how about this? You can simply say to upper and you can pass the function as a function reference rather than a method reference. So that is something that gives you ability to take regular functions and pass them through, and that can remove the verbosity in code quite a bit as well, and that becomes a really powerful way to communicate with the language. So that's an elegance of functional style. I'm merely touching this, uh, uh, scra uh, scraping the surface here of functional style. You can do a lot more here in Kotlin with the functional style of programming. But I want to move forward to show some other little features that you can benefit from. One interesting feature in Kotlin is Kotlin gives you operator overloading. Now, there are only two kinds of programmers in the world, those who love operator overloading and those who hate it. Okay, I'm sorry I said it wrong. Let me say it differently. There are three kinds of programmers in the world, those who love operator overloading, those who hate operator overloading, and those who abuse operator overloading. Uh, and, and I want to be the first category where I love it, but I don't abuse it. So we have to be very careful using operator overloading. But honestly, Operator overloading can make a life a lot easier. For example, let's think about one example here. Suppose I have a, a list, I'll call it as fruits, is equal to, and I'm gonna say a list of, let's say apple and orange. So I have a list of fruits of apple and orange. What do I wanna do? I wanna create a list of fruits where I'm gonna add banana to it. Well, how do I add banana to it? Notice the words we used, add banana to it. Well, you could say fruits.add, and then you could say banana, right? You, you could try something like that. And, and your goal here is to add it. Well, thankfully, that doesn't work. But the point really is, if your goal is to add it, why not simply add it? So if I were to just do a plus on it, what does that do? That adds banana to it. Well, that's kind of an interesting way to think about it, isn't it? This is an operator overloading. Excuse me, it did not change the original collection. So if I were to go ahead and run fruits one more time, our fruits contains apple and orange, but the new collection we created, we added banana to it. So we used a plus for it. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, if you can use a plus, can you use a minus as well? Right, so I'm gonna do a minus uh, apple. Now, that's removing apple. I know what you're thinking. If you can use a minus, can you use a multiply also, right? Now, remember what I said about abuse, right? So that clearly is an abuse, don't go there. So, of course, the question is, can I write a multiply uh, for an operator? The answer is, the question is not a can, the question is, should you? And the answer is no. So, in other words, use operators only where it is absolutely intuitive. If it is not intuitive to you, and more important to your fellow programmers, don't use operator overloading. Uh, to me, uh, there are times I don't even know an operator is overloaded, but as I'm writing code, it just occurs to me, oh, wouldn't it be so cool to be able to do it? And then you do it, and you see that it actually works, 
It's got to be that natural. That's how I felt about List, honestly. I did not know at the time List had a plus. As I was writing code in Kotlin, I said to myself, it'd be so cool if I can just do a plus. And I just did it. And then it works. I'm like, this is awesome. This has been implemented. Of course, honestly, I never tried multiply, but you know, you could be tempted. So the point really is that it's got to be really uh, intuitive for you to be able to do. And you can write your own operator overloaded functions. All that you do is you just you know, refer to this as operator, and then you are able to use that after that. Uh, mark the method annotated as an operator. Okay, so that's operator overloading, but there is also something else you can actually do quite effectively. This is extension functions. That's what they call it, extension functions. So what do extension functions really do for you? Well, let's go ahead and take a look at one example of this. Suppose you have a greet is equal to, and I have a greet called, uh, you know, hello. And what I want to do is to print greet first of all, and you can see that it printed greet. But if you are meeting a very long time friend after a very long time, you don't go to them and say hello, right? You scream hello because you're that excited seeing this person after a long time. So I want to say greet dot shout because you want to shout hello to them, not just say whisper hello. So I'm going to say shout. When I run this code, unfortunately, it doesn't work. But I think we can agree that string needs a method called shout. Would you agree? Absolutely, right? I mean, shout is absolutely a method we want because that truly brings our enthusiasm when we meet this person. Not a two uppercase, that's kind of boring, right? I want a shout method. Well, the beauty is you get to write any method you want to write. So like what? I'm going to say string dot shout. So right there is a function called string dot shout. So you can write any method you want to write on any class. So what am I going to do? This dot to uppercase, and I'm going to return uppercase when you call shout. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, did you just take the sacred string class and add a method to it? You know what? The last time I checked, we live in a free country, isn't it? We can absolutely do anything we want in our code. So this is really adding a method called shout, and internally it is calling the two uppercase. Now, this is okay, this is, this is really good, but I was giving this talk in a, in a conference uh, last year, and there was one person, kind of like where you are sitting, and, and when the person, this developer saw this, I, I could see in his eyes the thoughts he was going through, and immediately he's like, oh, 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 I got a question for you. And he, and he asked me to do something, and what bothered me is not the fact I could do what he wanted, but how excited he was when he found out you could actually do it. Really dangerous people sometimes. But what he wanted me to do was the following. He wanted to, uh, to, to redefine to lowercase as to uppercase. So you could call to lowercase and it prints to uppercase on it. Well, clearly, uh, don't do this, right? So, so don't do this. But he was so excited. He was absolutely convinced Scotland was great because I, do, I didn't quite follow him. I'm really, really scared to go to his work and see what he's going to do tomorrow, right? But the point really is sometimes you get overly excited about stuff like that can be very dangerous. So don't do this. It, it unfortunately works, as you can see, but, you know, absolutely all civility should stop us from doing something like this. This is dangerous, please. Does it give you a warning at least? No warnings, of course. If it gives you a warning, it's boring. Yeah, <laughs> so no warnings, absolutely. Um, but you want to kind of keep an eye for your developer who has that kind of you know, tendencies, right? This is, this is dangerous stuff. We don't want to do it. So, so this isn't it. So, yeah, please. Uh, sorry, do you have access to private? Uh, do you have access to private fields? Yeah. Well, okay, so really good question. So why don't I defer that to a few minutes? I'll talk about that in a few minutes. So I'll, I'll come back and talk about it. Um, so one other thing I want to quickly emphasize here, how does Kotlin really do this? I think that's a very important thing to understand. 
What Kotlin is very different from a lot of other languages in that sense. If you look at languages like Ruby or Groovy or various other languages that do metaprogramming, Kotlin does not alter the bytecode in any way. So Kotlin is not messing with your string class. Kotlin is not changing anything in your bytecode or string class. Instead, what Kotlin is doing is Kotlin is creating a separate static method. It creates a static method which takes the first argument of the type on which the method is injected, the function is injected. So it creates a static method which is taking string as the first argument. If your function takes two arguments, your static method takes three arguments, where the first one is the object on which the method is called. Then what Kotlin is doing is, it's a purely a syntax sugar. It rewrites this code as a call to the static method. So in this case, it calls the two lowercase static method and passes the greet object to it. And that's basically what Kotlin is doing behind the scenes. So as a result, it's a wrapper method that they are writing. That's what you're getting access to at this point. Okay, so uh, like I said, it's not part of the uh, class. That brings us to talking about, excuse me, object-oriented programming, and that will answer your question about uh, fields. I do have to say, I really like what they have done in Kotlin. In Kotlin, you never define fields. That's the beauty of it. So you never define fields. So in other words, this is such a departure from Java. What do you do in Java? In Java, you define fields. Then you define getters and setters. What Kotlin is saying is, you have zero reason to define a field. So Kotlin at compile time will create the fields for you. You never have access to fields directly. So you can only access properties and only the property getters or setters can access the fields. So these are the backing fields that Kotlin provides behind the scenes for you. So let's talk about how we can use this. First of all, classes are final by default. So if you create a class, you cannot extend from the class automatically. You have to make a class open if you want to extend from it. If you don't open a class, you cannot extend from it. So in other words, they want you to program with intention. They, they don't want your class to accidentally serve as a base class. So let's look at an example here, pardon me. So let's say class car, and I want to create an object of car, car equal to car, and I'm going to simply print out the car we created. So when I run the code, you can see an object of car is created. Did you notice how lightweight that syntax is? No ceremony, isn't it? So class car, and that's it. You don't have a curly braces, you don't have stuff you don't need, you don't care about, don't specify it. But I want to say this car was manufactured in a certain year, so I say val year is an integer. So as a result, 2018, and I can run this code this time, and I have a car, what year was this car manufactured? You can see that it is from the year 2018. Now make no mistake, year is not a field. Year is a property. Now, this is one thing I'm really sad about Java. Java did not ever give us true properties, isn't it? Java had the intention of the Java bean convention. You wrote a field, you wrote a getter, you wrote a setter, but you could never use it as a property. Java bean API gave you properties, but in your code, how do you access a property? Using the getters and using the setters, right? But in the case of Kotlin though, I'm gonna go ahead and say output car dot get ear. So what does get ear do? Get ear behind the scenes can give you the functions directly. So in this case, I'm gonna say car dot get ear and, and get ear is a getter that I'm gonna access. Well, if you're accessing Java code, when you say ear, it'll automatically call the get ear function for you without you having to use a get ear. The mapping happens to you fundamentally for you behind the scenes. But in this case, you can do one thing though. What if I say car dot ear equal to 2019? That's one way to try to keep the car new all the time. 
But when I run this code, notice I get an error. Val cannot be reassigned because it's a read only. You cannot modify it. But wait a minute. What if I do want to modify it? Well, I'm going to go to uh, make it a var for a minute. When I run the code, you can see I was able to modify it. Now, if I print car dot year, and notice at this time, the year value is 2019 rather than being 2018. But of course, you look at this and say, gosh, it gives me a feeling that I'm actually using a field, isn't it? Well, let's, let's mis uh, remove that uh, concern right now. So I'm going to go here, and I can define getters, and I can define setters as much as I want to. So for example here, let's go ahead and remove this for a second. We'll come back to this in a minute. So if I were to create a, a bar, let's start with the val. Val year, which is an integer. What I can do here is I can say get, and, and what is the get going to provide for me? The get is simply going to say a, a return and, and return the field I'm interested in. Let's start with baby steps right here. So I'm going to take a car right here. And, and what is the car going to do? I'm going to set a private setter here, if you will. So private set value. And what am I going to do here? A field is equal to value. So I can set the field and I can get the field out of it. So this becomes what is called a backing field. So you define properties, but you can define backing fields for this particular object. So if I were to create a private field, you obviously will not be allowed to modify it from the outside, but you could modify it from the inside of the class if you really wanted to. So this gives you an idea about how you can define these uh, within this object. For now, let's go ahead and just make it as a field you can actually access, if you will. So, so what am I going to do here? Make it a bar because obviously I have a setter for it. And, and this time, how am I going to actually use it? Well, I need to initialize this particular value, let's say equal to zero for a minute. So I'm giving it a value of zero to begin with. And now what am I going to do? I'm going to print out car.year. Notice I'm accessing it as a year. That's what I'm doing. But even though I never actually uh, defined a field for it. Then I say car.year is equal to 2018. And I'm going to print out car.year. And if you notice over here, you can see that it says 2018 at this point. But what if I don't want to allow a set? Well, then I can remove the setter. I can put it as a val here. But of course, in this case, I can never modify it. And val cannot be reassigned. It gives me an error at the point. So these are called backing fields. So when you use the word field, it is the private field you're accessing. Now, clearly, the word field is not available to you outside of the getter or a setter. But what, what this becomes really powerful is you can do something like this. You can go in and you can ask the question, if field is less than the value, uh, then you can assign the value to the field. So you're saying the year can only be after and not before. Whatever the business logic is, you can put that. Otherwise, what are you going to do? You could put a little check over here. You can say if the value is less than the field, or you can say throw, uh, throw uh, what uh, runtime exception, and I'm going to say invalid operation. What the word that you want to say as an invalid operation, you can say that. So in this case, if I were to go back over here and say car dot year is equal to 2019. I'm setting the value 2019. That was not a problem. What if I set the value to 2016? Well, then, of course, the value is less than the field, and you get a runtime exception. So you can start really providing uh, uh, checks and uh, validations with the properties very easily. And so you cannot bypass that. You can only go through the properties to get the fields. That makes your code a lot safer. So similarly, we saw a private setter. You can also write static methods, but static methods often go into companion objects. Now, of course, if you really want this to be static, you got to do some more work to expose this static in the Java side. But generally speaking, you can say these go into companion objects. So what are really companion objects? Uh, companion objects are, if you're used to Scala, it's a very similar idea in, in Kotlin right from Scala. So companion objects are really singletons 
that are attached to a particular class, and that's where you go to look for the class level methods. One other thing that is, uh, Kotlin provides really nicely is the concept of data classes. And, and, and Java is going to have data classes, I don't know in what version, but eventually you will see this in Java as well. So what does a data class provide for you? Let's take a look at an example. I say class person, and the class person contains a first name, which is a string, and a last name, which is a string also. So we have a, two strings. So that's very simple, isn't it? Now I say person, we'll say Alan equal to person, and we will create Alan and, and Turing right here. So now that I have created an Alan, I want to print out Alan. When I run this code, notice how sad that is. The two-string method doesn't give us anything useful. So how do I really make the two-string method work? Hey, here's an idea. I could go here and I could write the two-string method right in here. If I write that code, maybe that takes a one line of code. Maybe it takes a two lines of code, doesn't matter. The point is, I'm writing that code. But what am I going to do in that code? Most likely, I'm going to take the fields given to me and formulate them as a string and return. If you can do it, somebody else can do it too. Now, typically, what do we do in Java when we have code that is so repetitive that you have to write over and over and over? One example of that is getters and setters, isn't it? So what do you do in Java? You write a field, you write a getter, you write a setter, and then you say, time for coffee break, right? Because you have to write those three things. Most of us don't do it. So what do you do? You define the field, and you gently right-click on your IDE. And then you click a button. And before you could blink your eyes, the IDE vomits that code for you. And then what do you do? You live for the next seven years stepping over that vomit. And why do we have vomit in code? The reason we have vomit in code is the ID generated that for you, but who should really be creating it? It should be the compiler that's creating it. If the compiler creates the vomit, you don't see it in the source code. So it's easier to maintain the source code, isn't it? Well, that's the beauty. Notice what I'm going to do here. I'm going to go over here and say data class. Now, when I run the code this time, it actually prints the details for you automatically. So what's happening? What's happening here is a couple of nice little things. As an example, let's remove the data for just a minute. Let's go back here and say Alan 1 as a person, and I create Alan 2 as a person, and I'm going to simply go back here and say Alan 1 is equal to Alan 2. When I run this code, notice it said false. Well, that's because in Kotlin, double equals actually calls the dot equals method. And in this case, it said, hey, it's a false. Well, okay, it's not equal. Great, thank you for saying that. But what if I really want to compare the values of the objects, not just the identity? Well, I would argue Alan and Turing are the same, so these should be really same, isn't it? Well, if I mark this as a data class right now, and run the code, notice it said true this time. So without the data class, the result is a false, but with the data class, the result is a true. So what just happened? You notice that when you create a data class, Kotlin automatically creates a two-string method. It automatically creates an equals method. It also creates a hash code method. It also creates a component methods, which are useful for destructuring, so it's kind of like buy one, get four things free, right? So, so the generation of the code happens behind the scenes, so you don't have to waste your time creating those things. And, and so that's the data class minimizes a lot of effort. Similarly, when it comes to inheritance, there are actually two different concepts, uh, concepts I'll quickly mention here. You have inheritance, and you can only inherit from a class if the class is open, and, and Kotlin makes inheritance a lot more safer as well, and as a result, life becomes a lot easier. But Kotlin also gives you laziness by through delegation. So if you think about using Kotlin for object-oriented programming, you normally use inheritance, but inheritance is not a good tool for reuse. 
inheritance is really good for using for um, uh, substitutability. But what if you really want to just reuse an object and perform delegation? Kotlin has a really powerful way to delegate as well. And as a result, you can use delegation and you're not forced to use inheritance. If you're used to delegation in Groovy, you can do similar things, but here it provides you with a greater amount of type safety as well. And of course, if multiple you know, interfaces come together, you can uh, delegate to multiple implementations and interfaces as well, gives you quite a bit of flexibility. But what I want to end this talk with is talk a little bit about fluency. And fluency is something I care a lot about. Um, I, I mentioned earlier that I started programming because of the science and math in it, but I really continued programming because of the art in it, the elegance and the power of expressiveness. And there are days I would sit there and stare at a piece of code and I would just not feel right. I want to make this a little bit more fluid, a little bit more better. And then you struggle with it and then eventually you find a way to make it better. So I'll talk about fluency here just a little bit. So let's start with the first example here. I create a class and the class here is called pizza. So I want to create a pizza. So what am I going to have for a pizza? I'm going to define a function here, a, a method. It's called spread. And the spread is going to spread some kind of a sauce. So I'm going to say sauce over here. Uh, and, and, and the sauce is going to be just a string. And all I will do is simply print out, uh, we'll just say spread. So, uh, so let's start with that. So I want to call the spread method. So how do we do this? So I'll say val pizza is equal to pizza. We create a pizza object. Now I'm going to say a pizza dot spread and I'm going to spread cheese on it. So if I run this code, you can see that it says it's going to spread the sauce. Okay, it's complaining that sauce is never used. Uh, okay, spread and then we'll simply say a sauce that it's going to be spreading. So, so whatever sauce, maybe tomato, right? So, uh, so I'm going to just say spread sauce. So if you notice over here, spread tomato. Well, that's great so far, but looking at this code, why can't we make this a little bit more fluent? Why can't we just say uh, pizza dot spread and tomato like this? So no dot, no uh, uh, a parenthesis, right? That makes the code a little bit more fluent, isn't it? Well, unfortunately, that won't work, but, but it gives us a clue as to what to do. Notice it says infix modifier is required. That's what it says right there. So I'm going to go here and say infix right there. So this time around, it becomes what's called an infix. And when you run this code right here, you can see that it's quite happy to accept it. So this is an example of how you can take this object, pizza, and then a space, and then the method, and then the parameter. Well, one small detail though, when you're using an infix, para, uh, infix uh, uh, annotation, you can only have one argument, one parameter passed to this function. You cannot have two, that's a limitation in Kotlin, so you cannot put multiple values or zero value, it requires one of them. But we can take these ideas and we can build fluency into this. This is one of the places where I'm a big fan of doing DSLs, domain specific languages. So what is a DSL? A DSL can become a very fluent syntax. DSLs often have a context and they also have a great amount of fluency built in as well. So how do we use DSLs over here? So to understand this, I'm going to create a little example and, and build on it a little bit. So operate, I'm going to say operate, and to the operate function, I'm going to say turn uh, left, and I'm going to then say uh, turn right, and I'm going to say run fast. Now look at that for a minute. This actually is a Kotlin code that we can actually execute. Now you look at this and say, huh, how do you really make that code to run? Well, there are a few things we have to make work for this code actually to run. We're not there yet, obviously. So I'll comment it out and we will, when we are done with our effort, we'll be able to run exactly that code. So let's see how we can do this. First of all, what in the world is operate? Operate is a function. So we can create a function and this is called operate. And what is the operate function going to take as an argument? Well, as an argument, it takes uh, something with a curly 
looks like a lambda after all. Okay, so it could be a lambda. So we could pass to it a function. And what does that function take as an argument? Well, it's going to take something as an argument. What is it going to return? Maybe nothing. Maybe I don't care for it to return anything. So in this case, I could say it return takes a, 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 a nothing and it returns a unit. Unit is simply saying, I don't have anything to return. I'm a void function. So that could be saying it's a, it's a lambda that takes nothing and returns nothing. We can take baby steps and work through it. So let's start with this little function. What am I going to do with an operate? All I'm going to do here is simply say a uh, called for now. Like I said, we'll take baby steps and see where it takes us. So that's my first code is to just write the function and I'm going to pass that to it. Now ignore the warning for a little bit. So what am I going to do? I'm going to call operate and pass nothing to it. So when I run this code, you can see it says called. But within the function, what am I going to do? I'm just going to call the function func that I've passed in. So if I execute that function, what is it going to do? It's going to come in here and execute this lambda after all. When I call operate, it executes that lambda. So far, so good. Then what's the next thing I'm going to do? I'm going to say robot is an arrow. And I'm going to say robot dot turn. And I'm going to say left over here. Aha. So I'm using a robot. And the robot dot turn is going to ask the robot to turn left. Hey, that's great. So class called robot. And, and what am I going to do with the robot? I'm going to have a function here. And the function is called turn. It takes a direction, which is a string. And all I'm going to do is simply print out turning dollar direction. So that will tell me I'm turning left or turning right. Hey, that will be really easy to work with. Now, how do I work with the robot? Oh, here's an idea. Let's go ahead and create a robot. So I'll say robot is the parameter type. So I'll say val robot is equal to robot. And I'll pass the robot to that particular function. So if I execute that code right now, you can see how it says turning left. Hey, that's a progress. Let's try this again. I'll go back here and say robot.turn. And I will say right. And that should say turning right. That's awesome. Let's go a step further. Robot dot, and I'm going to say uh, run, and I'll say fast. So in this case, I'll say fun, we'll say run, and then we'll say, uh, you know, how, and we will go ahead and say string is equal to print, and we'll say running dollar how. So it should say running fast. So that's all working really well. We're making progress in some definition of progress, but we're not there yet. It's not that fluent yet. What, should, what can we do next? Oh, it'll be so cool if we did not have to say robot dot and robot dot and robot dot, isn't it? That would be really nice to leave out uh, that. Well, okay, so we could try something a little bit. We could say uh, it in here, just to avoid that, it turn well, okay, I'll change it a little bit. Turns, turns, and runs. So it's a little bit more fluent. So I could say turns and turns and runs. And in that case, this becomes a turns and runs. And of course, if I try that code, it is going to give us the turns and runs. But then I could play with this a little bit. I could say it turns and it turns and it runs. Then I can remove that part because Kotlin already gives me the way to use it, so I could remove that part. Hey, we're getting a little bit closer to that, right? So it turns left, it turns right, it turns fast, and, and, and I can do that. But I want to get rid of the dot in the parenthesis. You already know how to do that. So what am I going to do? Go to these methods and say infix on those two. And by marking those two functions as infix, what can I do? I can now say remove that part and then I can remove this parenthesis from here and as a result I can remove the parenthesis from the end as well and you can see how that's able to work. So we are almost there but wait a minute I want to say left here not a double quoted left. Hmm. 
how do I say left over here? Now, this is where we have to think a little deeper about what the language is doing. Now, let's go back and think about this for a second. How do I get rid of that little double quoted string? Okay, not yet. We're not there yet, so we'll come back to that in just a minute. So, let's go back and run this code one more time. It's working. Let's step back for a minute before we come back here. If dot turns left, so that we understand, right? So, that's calling the left uh, string on the turns. Let's try this again. What about if I write it this way? If dot turns, and if I said if dot left, hey, I know that's not looking elegant. That looks actually more ugly, but sometimes you have to make things ugly before you make them beautiful, right? So, if dot left, will that work? Maybe worth examining. Let's try this. So I go back here and say val left is equal to left, val right is equal to right, and val fast is equal to fast. Let's try this again and run the code this time, and it works. So I could say it dot left. Great. Let's do this then. How about it dot left and it dot right uh, and it dot fast like that. So that's working. But I know what you're thinking. You're like, no, I want left, not it dot left. This is not fluent. This actually stinks, right? Okay, so here's where we're gonna play a little trick. The trick is, let's step back for a second. What if I said this dot left? And you're like, Venkat, is that somehow better, right? Instead of it, we are saying this. Just entertain for a minute. What if I say this dot left? Well, if I say this dot left, then we know we can remove the this dot eventually, isn't it? So how do I make this work with the this dot? This is where a beautiful feature comes into Kotlin. And honestly, this took me a little bit of effort to understand. And I was struggling with this until I said to myself, because Kotlin is a language that brings in capabilities from other languages, I was curious what other language did this. And I was surprised I didn't realize it first. JavaScript. JavaScript has a beautiful feature of attaching context object to functions. And we can use that here very nicely. So how does this work? You can go to Kotlin and say, robot dot. When you write a function, a lambda like this, this says that this lambda will execute in the context of this object. It can be anything. It doesn't have to be a robot here. It could be some class, whatever that class is, x dot, whatever that name is, right? You can provide that. In this case, I'm making the context object the same as my uh, object, which I'm passing as a parameter. So what does this mean? This means that this function is an instance function on the object. So you can say robot dot and a lambda. To me, this is amazing. Because what this is telling you is, you can take an arbitrary lambda and run the lambda like it's a method of a class. Weird, isn't it? But this is why if you understand how this works in JavaScript, it becomes really easy. Because in JavaScript, you can take any arbitrary function and run that function as if it's a method of your object. So in other words, you can just take a function and say, hey, you, I like you to be my method. And you're just acquiring this random function as a method of your class. So what am I going to do here? I brought in the lambda robber, uh, uh, robot here, and I'm going to run that in the context of this object. So when I run this code, notice it quietly was happy. That is because now this is really what's here, which means I can remove the this from here, which means I can simply get rid of that, this dot, and what does that provide for me? I can remove the it, I can remove this, and what I'm left with is the code in the bottom. And you can run that 
very nicely now because it becomes really fluent. So how do you do this again? What you can do is you can, let me see if I can shrink that all to the one screen. So you can do the following. You can bring that over and say, I want to take the infix notation and the infix notation says, you don't need to use a dot and a parenthesis. And then I'm saying, I'm going to take this operate and I'm going to re receive a lambda which runs in the context of another object. And so as a result in this code, on line number 16, what is this? On line number 16, this it is the parameter to the lambda. But there is an implicit this. And the this is attached to the left. So as a result, you're able to leverage the fluency using a few different ideas together. So, so of course, writing a DSL requires really mastering the language and bending it and to make it behave like the way you want it. In a way, it's kind of like twisting the words, right? And you are trying to really make it very rhythmic and, and that's what you're doing with this kind of approach, but a very powerful way to create that kind of syntax and you can see how that actually comes together. And so with that, you can create some really fluent code. You can see that fluency come out in several different places. Uh, for example, Spring is beginning to use Kotlin quite a, uh, uh, quite, quite a bit, where the Spring API, there's a project called Foo, F-U. If you haven't had a chance to take a look at it, take a look at it. And Spring uh, Foo is a functional API uh, created using Kotlin that gives you a lot of fluency to create Spring applications. So this is becoming a lot more prevalent to create a Kotlin code with a greater amount of fluency. The language itself is already fluent, but you can push the boundaries even more, as you can see in this example. So, so that brings us to the end of the presentation. So basically, we are talking about how you can leverage this language. Uh, it, is, it is one of the languages that is truly multi-platform, like I started with. But, but, but a lot of reasons why, there are several reasons why programmers love Kotlin. For me, one of the reasons I love the language is the fluency the language really offers. Uh, things are just natural to be able to fit it in and, and write code with it. So it removes a lot of ceremony that you have in the code often. That's one of the things I really like about the language. So questions, comments? Yep. Uh, in terms of GBM ecosystem, uh, 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 how do you see official Scala together with Kotlin? Because obviously they took the same niche, so uh, should be split for both Kotlin. Um, generally, I avoid questions uh, that will put me on a spot. <laughs> uh, I love them all. I know a lot of companies which are heavily using Scala, and uh, I think they would completely use it. Uh, there are some really good libraries created using Scala. And, and I think that's truly the, the nature of the world we live in, is that we really can benefit from uh, you know, different languages to exist. Uh, languages will continue in a way, right? Uh, Kotlin would not be here uh, if those languages have not innovated in the, in the past. So to a, to a great degree, it's a little unfair to discard those languages because we have something new and shiny. Uh, but at the same time, uh, Kotlin also has its own uh, space, uh, place. And that's why I think the languages will continue to thrive in different areas and different uh, uh, aspects of where they are programming. Uh, but eventually, right, uh, we are, if you really think about it, we are only in this field for 60 to 70 years. Uh, if you look at the history of human evolution, uh, almost everything humans have been doing, we've been doing it for centuries, right? Medicine has been done for so long, and, uh, and this is an area. There are two things that our humans are very new to. Well, if you think about flying, we've been flying for, what, 100 years or so, give or take, uh, and we've been writing code for even less. Uh, so this is too early to settle down. So, so what I'm saying in such long words is, uh, it's not about what Kotlin is going to replace, because Kotlin itself will be replaced with something else uh, in the future because our history is so small, so, so uh, short, we are learning very drastically and, and we should really uh, evolve and change. That, that's where the future really is. Yeah. So please. either the replacement will be quicker and then the Scala will like, die or something like that? Um, I, don't, I don't think so. I, uh, this goes to my earlier presentation. It, it requires a generation. So look for the person younger than us 
to, to see that. Please. Yeah. Thank, thank you so much for the great presentation. Thank you. I have two questions. Yeah. So the first one is about um, what, what does Kotlin bring to arrow handling? Because, for example, you were talking a lot about strings in Java. And when you start integrating with legacy systems in Java, you realize that check exceptions just don't work in Lambda. This like, breaks the whole like, elegance here. Doing so, what does Kotlin bring to arrow handling? And what does Kotlin has to say for security? Because Java is very constructive, JDK is being bashed, like, I know, 20 times a year. How about Kotlin? Yeah, so, so first of all, going back to your earlier question about um, the streams, the problem with streams really is um, the idea of exception handling does not, is an imperative concept. It doesn't fit with functional idea. Uh, so Java doesn't handle that at all, right? Uh, on the other hand, I don't think Scala or Haskell has a better answer either. And the reason I say that is because when you do those in those languages, the code is not very cohesive. I'm not very happy with what they're doing. So the short answer to that question is, it's not a problem of the language, the problem of the paradigm. And, and Kotlin makes error handling a lot better in twofold. One is the compiler is much more vigilant in checking for things. Also, we talked about the nullable types. So in those areas, you get a better error, but Scotland will not solve the problem of exception handling in streams or function and pipeline because that's not a problem of the language, it's a problem of the paradigm itself. We need to rethink about how we uh, deal with it, and, and that's why functional style makes a lot more sense for pure functions not where you're going to have a lot of exceptions, it's not going to be. This is one of the reasons I would argue that why coroutines are really not using the functional pipeline. They are built off of the concept of uh, imperative style. So there's a clear reason for it. This is one of the reasons why async and await in JavaScript is imperative in nature, not the promises like functional pipeline. So it's a more of a, a paradigm problem than a language problem per se. Uh, but the second thing is about uh, security itself. Uh, keep in mind that Kotlin is a multi-platform language. So it depends on where you're compiling it down to. If you're compiling it to JavaScript versus uh, WebAssembly versus Android versus iOS, native code versus JavaScript. So Kotlin itself will not make it any more secure or any less secure than the platform on which you are running. Because at the end of the day, where you're running the code, you still are dependent on what's possible in that environment. Uh, so, so Kotlin will not make it any less secure, I can say that, but Kotlin is, is not going to be able to make it any more secure than what the platform can provide because the platform ultimately rules. When you're writing code in, on the JVM, you can mix Java and Kotlin code. So Kotlin cannot take more responsibility than the JVM can take, right? So similarly on other platforms too. So I don't think you're going to get much with it uh, from the language itself from that point of, point of, point of view. Uh, I would love to hear more questions, but I'm also afraid that you will probably not be in time for, for the airplane, right? So uh, this is for the best question, uh, author. Uh, well, I, I don't remember the questions now. <laughs> I've been busy answering it. So there were two of them. All right. The yes. security and error handling, and another about... Both yeah. So I'll just pass to the last question we got. If you can just pass okay. it all the way, this down. down. And uh, yeah. I hope you enjoyed our community. This is. Uh, oh, thank you so us. much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, I had a wonderful time being here. Yeah, thank there you. is nothing illegal, so you may bring it uh, <laughs> safely to the airplane. Uh, we have like uh, a couple of minutes to um, to win some uh, licenses and so on. And for now, we would. Just let you go. All you right, wonderful. Need. Thank you. Thank you so Pleasure. much. Thank you, so much. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.